Thank you all for coming tonight. I know it's a small crowd, but it'll be <laughs> intimate to ask your questions. Um, so my name is Michael Bell. I'm a study abroad advisor here. I know I've chatted with a couple of you already about study abroad, um, but tonight we have some students from a variety of different programs who have studied abroad, and they're here to share about their experiences as well as answer any of your questions. So they're going to start off by introducing themselves, their major, and where they studied abroad, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Okay. Hello, I'm Niklas. I'm majoring in German and computer science, and I studied with the BCA Mobwood program in Mobwood, Germany. All right. Hi, I'm Delaney. I am a senior sociology anthropology major, and I studied at the at Bifrost University in Iceland uh, as a part of a new program that's uh, just been offered in the last year. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm an English major, and I studied abroad in England um, this past May on a faculty-led trip for two weeks. We stayed in Bath, Oxford, and London. I'm Maggie, I'm a senior mass communications major and I studied abroad in London, England at the University of Roehampton and I also went on the faculty-led Ireland trip last May. Hi, I'm Katie, I'm a junior OT student and I went on the May trip to Vietnam. It was a faculty-led trip um, this past May. Uh, my name is Jack Trigo, I'm a senior French major uh, and I went abroad to France for a year. I studied, studied at the Catholic Institute in Paris in the fall and I did uh, an internship program with IV in the spring. My name is Alyssa Van Linton. I'm a senior middle level education major, and I studied at the University of Sterling in Sterling, Scotland. Thank you. All right. Cool. Any particular questions that you guys have <laughs> that Diane have answered right now? I can start off too if that helps. Um, anything? Take no? Okay. Um, can you guys talk a little bit more about like, the courses and how you got them pre-approved and ultimately what courses you took and how they were different or similar to Etown? You can jump in and say either go down the line and it works. So I only took three courses um, and they were only twice a week so it was a little bit of a, of, a, of a schedule change because I had classes two days a week and then I was essentially had this long weekend which you would think means, oh, I can go do things because I have, you know, a five-day weekend. That's not the case. Um, I took a Intro to Criminology course, I took a Shakespeare in London course, and then I took, oh, shoot, I'm forgetting another one, a Women in Feminism in Film class. And what you do is you, is you can, um, at least for Roehampton, they gave us a link to all of the courses that study abroad students can take, and study abroad students can take anything they want. It doesn't have to be specifically within their major. And then I took it to the department chair of the communications department, uh, Dr. Skillen, and he looked it over and said, okay, well, we can apply this to either, you know, special, like a, an English special course was what my, my Shakespeare class ended up going under, uh, my women in feminism ended up going under a, a communication special course, and then criminology actually counts for my sociology core, so that was really nice, and I got a bunch of core and a bunch of things to complete my minor out of the way. And they'll either approve them or deny them, and then they send them off to, uh, you know, whatever your study abroad school is, and they get them approved, and then you kind of just have to adjust from there. And we could drop or pick up courses just like here. You know, it was a little bit of a different way of going about it, but if you didn't like a class and you thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm not going to be able to, you know, handle this, you could still drop it if you wanted to. Um, through Bfrost, it was a pretty easy, process of getting my classes approved and like also changing things when I didn't uh, see that I was going to need them. Uh, the way that their program works is like very different <coughs> than here. There's, I took five classes in one semester, but like three of them were for six weeks and three of them were for another six weeks with like a very long like a break in between. Uh, they meet once a week, the classes, uh, for like probably three hours, but they only meet once a week so usually again like you said had like a five-day weekend um, and a lot of the times the classes were instructed over a uh, lecture like online lecture Le they filmed the teachers would film a lecture you'd watch it and do some readings and then uh, go to class to a ask questions that you had uh, to get things approved before I went I we do the forms through the study abroad office and a lot of the courses at before specifically are good for uh, public policy Politics. I took a couple business classes. I took a leadership class, 
Uh, I took a language and culture class for my Anthro elective. And I took like a human resources management for the last of my sociology elective uh, to complete that part of my major. Uh, and then when I was there and I found that I was taking a course I didn't want to take, I just sent an email to our international student director. And he said, cool, and everything was changed online within a, like a day or two. Uh, so, and then I would obviously be in email contact with Megan. Um, but the classes were good, they were pretty engaging, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity there for people looking to maybe like, if you're trying to do like a politics or a business major or minor, um, it does allow for a lot of free time too, which was excellent. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so when I studied in Paris in the fall, um, the program called CIS Abroad didn't have a current list of classes. They just had previous classes. Um, honestly, because French colleges aren't really up to date, they're kind of, they work with paper and pencil, really. Um, so I got like a bunch of classes pre-approved from previous years, but I didn't really know exactly what classes I was gonna take uh, or which would be available. So once I got there and I did like a proficiency test, they gave me a list and then I could change it. Um, so I guess one tip, is that you should definitely get a bunch of classes pre-approved, just in case, uh, you never know what'll happen. Um, but in terms of classes, I had a great experience like the rest of them here. Um, classes were once a week for three or four hours. I took a class in French language, um, you know, grammar, writing, speaking, all that. Um, in French phonetics, which really helped me fine tune my pronunciation. Uh, a French cinema course, and then in a European Union uh, course. Um, and then I was able to get my European Union course to actually count for one of my minors, uh, which is international studies. Um, so you can really work with it. Um, I, I, th I feel like a lot of the courses, you can really make a case for uh, one of your minors or one of your majors. Uh, and it's pretty easy to do, I think. Katie and Alyssa, can you answer that too? Because we've got students interested in your particular programs. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, so I actually almost went to Australia, which is kind of a Funny story. I was like approved and everything, and then the last day I decided to switch to Sterling because the classes matched up a lot better with what I wanted to fulfill in my minors. So I have English and Psychology minors, and because my schedule is kind of jam packed, I needed those credits abroad to count for those minors. Um, so basically, what I did is I looked at the classes that Sterling had available, and I looked at the ones I needed to take for my minors, and I said, Well, these are pretty much about the same, and you know, you you put them in the same document and send it to your advisor and they you know, approve it or don't approve it. So that's, that was my process. Um, and then when I got there, because I was already enrolled in my classes and everything, so um, we met, you have a lecture and a seminar component. So the lecture is, it's usually, I think my smallest lecture was maybe 30, 40 people and then the biggest one was um, maybe 300 people-ish. Um, so you have that lecture component and then the seminar component. And the lectures, um, never took attendance, so you really didn't have to be there. And then all of my seminars were on Mondays. I only took three classes abroad. Um, so all my seminars were on Mondays, and I didn't go to class the rest of the week. <laughs> Which, not many people have that experience, but it worked out great. I did spend a lot of time reading, doing homework, because I took two English classes. Um, yeah, but otherwise, I enjoyed my classes, especially the seminars, because they were more engaging. But uh, the content, it was good. I liked it. And then as far as the midterms, um, you don't actually study, like take any classes when you're abroad, but um, the Vietnam trip especially had a two credit class in the spring semester. So we went once a week, it was like a two hour um, night class, and we just learned a little bit about the culture, a little bit about the history, um, some team building with the people that you'd be going on the trip with, um, and just some other just little stuff to kind of get us prepared for the trip. And so that was two credits. And then that was actually like graded. I don't think anyone got less than an A though. <laughs> um, and then when we actually went abroad, that was also another two credit, which was half fail. So it ended up being four credits um, out of the way as well. So that was nice. Inspirations and questions to ask? <laughs> um, can you guys talk a little bit about housing um, and your housing on your programs and what that, what that looked like? Do you want to have your own bedroom and bathroom? Because I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the housing at um, Bifrost is, is really uh, interesting. It's in the country, so like, and there's not a lot of people physically going. There's a lot of people taking online classes there, native Icelanders. 
Uh, so when I lived there, I lived in a townhouse with like six people and we each got our own uh, room and bathroom, uh, separate from like the kitchen and the living spaces. Uh, and we lived kind of in the quads, like it, they looked like the quads, but maybe slightly tinier. Um, tinier but with more rooms, funny enough. And um, in terms of housing, it was just a tiny little community of like people living in this village and in these apartments and uh, exchange student uh, quads. And should I talk a little bit about the area sure. too? Um, not gonna lie, it is a little bit in the middle of nowhere. The closest grocery, it's kind of like uh, Elizabethtown where the closest to like stores where you can actually buy a lot more than just what you need are like 30 minutes out, but they have buses and things like that. Um, and it's got a remoteness and like a natural preservation to it that makes the, the living space really, really nice to live in. It's very peaceful and there's lots of hiking trails and waterfalls and so if you like remoteness, having your own bathroom and getting really close to the people who live in your area, that's a great place to go. I think I had a similar thing to that, but it was flats, so they were co-ed flats, so it was women and men living in the same dorm, which I was not expecting because, you know, usually here it's, you know, people of the same gender in the in rooms together, and it was similar to that. I didn't have my own bathroom, but it was sort of, it was a flat, so there's different houses in Roehampton. It's kind of like Harry Potter. Um, and I was kind of all the way on the on the south end of the campus, and, or the north end of the campus, sorry. Um, and so when you walked in, it was basically just one long hallway with sort of doors on each end. And then all the way at the end was the kitchen. It was a shared kitchen. And then each flatmate got their own bedroom. And in the bedroom was a bed, and there was a window, and there was a desk. But there was also a sink, which was really helpful for me, so I didn't have to bother my flatmates in the morning. And then down at the end of the hallway, across from the kitchen, was the bathrooms. So there was there was no in individual bathrooms, which was unfortunate, but it was nice because you had your own your own room, which was really really nice. You do have to shop for your own food, which is if you've never lived if you haven't lived in any of the apartments or the quads before, that can be a little bit of a shock, especially in London, where you have to take the bus about 20 minutes out to go to Asda to get food and bring it back. What I had to do was I had to take a duffel bag and just pile it with food and then take that back on the bus and look like a very awkward American. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be a little bit of a struggle getting you know food to and from. But you know, you learn to cook, you cook with your flatmates, you sort of figure out, oh, I'm gonna make this this night, I'm gonna make this this night. Or, you know, worst case scenario, you go to the corner store and grab something and it, it definitely teaches you to be a little bit more independent and figure yourself out, especially because I was living in London where you do have to figure out public transportation quite quickly. I was not in the middle of nowhere, but I was kind of, I was sort of all the way in South London. So to get anywhere, you had to take a bus and then a tube to get anywhere. So you had to really familiarize yourself quite quickly with how to use public transportation. And it's extremely easy once you figure it out. You just tap your card, get on the bus, tap your card, get on the tube, you know. And unfortunately, we had an incident where the bridge to get into town is just no longer structurally stable, but that was the biggest problem we had and that was nature's fault, not, you know, the fault of public transportation. And London is super good about public transportation. You know, if if a bridge decides it doesn't want to work anymore, they find a way around it and you know they take you opposite uh, like other directions and there's apps and things to help you out. And if you put a SIM card in your phone, Google Maps works just fine. So it's easy it's easier to get around than you think. Um, as far as housing on the Vietnam trip, I know I have a few issues out there, so I'll keep talking. Um, to five different cities so we actually stayed in hotels the entire time and these hotels were the nicest hotels that I have ever stayed in like nicer than I've ever stayed in here they were like three to four stars in Vietnam which is like six stars here so it's ridiculous um, but they were super nice super fancy um, they were always clean I know um, people told us to like look out for like bugs while you're over there I never came into any contact with any like bug in my room um, at all and they were super nice we didn't have to worry about anything the people that the faculty and the people that are in charge of written folk which is the organization that we went with they organized all of that so we showed up to the hotel they had like 30 cards for us and we just all bought our room our room keys and just kind of went upstairs so it was very nice just to be able to say that you were taken care of and all the hotels were just awesome <laughs> Yeah, so basically we, it's not 
study abroad application, you have the initial application and then you have the post-approved application. So in the post-approved application is where we're gonna do the course approval form, you're gonna read study abroad agreements, um, you're gonna submit your flight information, you apply for ETOM scholarships, that kind of stuff. So it's just, an, we have an ETOM form, your program might also have a course approval form or like submitting your courses before you go. Of course, registration for each program is a little bit different, but from ETOM's perspective, we'll have one page is for major and minor courses, so if you're gonna take anything for that, you get it signed off by your academic advisor and they'd say, oh, this um, COM 100 course equals our COM 100 course here. If it doesn't, somebody mentioned having it be like a special topics course. That's an option as well that would still count for your major and your minor, but it doesn't directly translate to one specific requirement. Um, and then for core, we have a separate page for that. You can just say, oh, I'm hoping this photography course counts for creative expression, and then ultimately the registrar and registration records will sign off on that. So it goes through a couple different hands. You'll look at it. Um, you'll have your academic advisor sign it. You'll hand it in to me. I'll double check what's available on the course catalogs that currently exist online and just make sure you didn't pick courses that aren't offered this semester or um, that are, aren't offered on campus. You're actually gonna be studying them at another campus the university works with. And then I'll send it off to registration and records and just make sure um, that they agree with the, the credit conversion because each school has different unique credits and what E-Town is actually gonna honor because your um, provider might say, this counts for this many credits, but ultimately E-Town has the final say on how many credits you'll earn for that course. Um, so we'll make sure that's all outlined for you. And then if you get abroad and something changes or you wanna change the class, just email me and we'll get that form uh, updated for you. So it continues to be a living document, um, but we just wanna make sure everything's on that form so that you don't come back with your transcript later and we're like, we didn't know she was taking this course. Um, and then we don't know for sure if it's gonna transfer back the way we want it to. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Anybody else have any other hands? No? Um, all right. What is like one thing that you wish you would have told your former self like before you studied abroad? Like my roommate situation or like 
how to get a phone plan or how to get groceries or like how to travel around Paris. Uh, and like slowly but surely, like literally within a week or two, I had everything. Like my phone plan was like 20 euro a month. My roommate came, he was awesome. There were grocery stores all around me. I figured out the metro system and the bus system in Paris, which are amazing. They're always on time, they get you everywhere. Um, and then like, as for friends, I went to the Catholic Institute in Paris, uh, which holds both French students, but then also a lot of international students. So I found a lot of, well, for one hand, uh, Americans, um, who I made friends with, and I, I'm still in touch with. But then I also was in classes with uh, just like adults from like Malaysia or Germany or Czech Republic or Brazil, um, who like worked. Like I met a guy from named Roberto. He was like in his 40s or 50s. He was working at like the Brazilian consulate, and we're friends now, and that's cool. Um, so yeah, like, yeah, don't worry, chill out, everything will be fun. Just like, relax. Yeah, that's it. I'm kind of along the same lines. Um, just be flexible, especially with the matrons. Um, obviously, I went to Vietnam, but I think it's the same for a lot of the matron trips. You have kind of an itinerary set out, and you don't necessarily follow it. Um, especially for us, like, things changed, like, by the minute, like it was very, um, Rachel's nodding, she went as well. Um, and so it was just trust who you're with. Um, for us, we didn't have the issue of like making friends because there was like a group of 20 of us that came all from each town and the class before it, like really you became close to your travel mates. Um, so we didn't have to worry about that, but you just need to be able to trust the faculty and the people who are leading the trip and understand that something might change and that's okay because they have you in good hands and everything that we did, there wasn't anything that I like regretted or anything that I'm like, oh, I wish we could have done this instead of going here. So everything kind of does work out um, and you have a great experience. So just trust who you're with and be flexible, I guess. I think be flexible is very important. Um, I had a horrible experience also growing up, but I think my plane was delayed and then I had short labor, missed my flight, and then my luggage was lost. So it, it wasn't great. Um, but through this, like, it sounds horrible, but I learned so much. I think, like, in this first couple of days, when I was in uni and felt like, um, so I think instead of getting frustrated and upset about things that happened, realize that everything that happens can teach you something, and that even if something goes differently than you thought, it's not necessarily going wrong. It's just different. Which, no matter where you go, I think that's a concept that you kind of come to understand is when something is different than what you're used to, it's not necessarily wrong. Um, yeah. Any questions? Um, so, did any of you try any of the new PJ albums? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Iceland is a very like meat and potatoes place. They don't. A lot of food is actually expensive because it's all shipped into the country, although they do have greenhouses now. Um, do try skier. It's like really hard Greek yogurt and it's delicious. Put milk in it. I was surprised by that too, but um, try like they have like they eat a lot of like lamb and sheep. It's really good. It's not scary if you've never had it before. Um, honestly, try everything, but if someone offers you shark, Get ready to hold your breath a little bit for the next couple of hours. Also get ready to wash whatever you were wearing when the shark came into the room because it it leaves an odor for several days. Um, but yeah, they have like certain foods that are traditional uh, that were eaten over the winter. So like they had time to digest it. Um, but it's just a part of the, the experience to like go there and try things. It's like if you were going to a country where they ate bugs and you eat a bug. But most of the food's very, very good. Best hot dog I've ever had. I think, I mean, England is a very boring uh, country to us. Um, but they do, the, the fun thing about London was that there's so many different cultures that have sort of mashed themselves together. So a lot of the fun for me was not getting the fish and chips or the shepherd's pie because my stepdad's English. I'm used to that stuff. It was more the Indian food, the Ethiopian food, the Vietnamese food that were just in all of these different little 
you know, shops around the corner that you could walk to or you could take a bus to. I think that's the fun thing about living in such a, a big metropolis is that there's so many different cultures living together that it's not just the, the English stuff, it's the stuff from every other culture that has decided to make that city, call that city home. And I think that's one of the fun parts about living in such a, a big city is that it's, it's it, there's there's a lot going on and I don't I don't think if I lived there for two years that I could have you know gotten to every sort of aspect of it yeah talking about London um, if you ever go I would suggest going to Borough Market it's it's a very big market that just has like any kind of food that you could think of really it's pretty great when I was there. I was only in London for uh, six days, um, but we did like a walking food tour. Um, <laughs> so we were able to go to Lower Market and go around and have our tour guide kind of show us the local um, things that um, a lot of people, like underground kind of things that people don't know about. And um, she was kind of talking about how, even though English food is kind of more bland, um, they're starting to kind of get more green and healthy and um, really organic products. And I think that really shows in Borough Market. Yes. And then we had gone, we were there for like two and a half weeks. And I think every meal that I had, except for maybe three, were all like traditional Vietnamese food. Um, I'm a very picky eater, but I was actually very like adventurous with my food when I went there, and I basically tried mostly everything. Um, there was only one meal that I really did not like. Um, everything else I was able to find something, whether it was just rice and like some sort of meat um, that um, I, I didn't eat over, but for the most part I liked everything, um, and that's coming from a picky eater, so, um, but it was, it was very nice. and. You can honestly find a lot of places. Like we went to Hard Rock Cafe the one night because it was like five nights in, not even like three, four nights in, and we're like, we need some American food, and so we um, took a taxi down to Hard Rock. Um, but like you're able to find that as well, like when you need it. But then also like it's part of the experience. Like all of you guys have said, it, if you're going to a different country, you almost have to try the food and get like immersed into that culture, even if it's just for like two to three weeks or if it's for a whole year. Um, so that's something that I highly recommend, just trying everything um, made in a restaurant, maybe not off of the street market, um, but everything I would try and just give it a little taste. Yeah. Um, do you find it difficult to manage your money abroad? Like, did you spend a lot more than you thought you would? Yeah. 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 I think, I, I don't know what the, the you know currencies were for the rest of you, but pounds have a really terrible conversion rate. Mm -hmm. I I'm gonna be honest. I never you know memorize the conversion rate. I just you know, and I and I do, and I I have a bit of a shopping problem. I will admit. Um, but as long as you're not spending exorbitant amounts of money, I think you should be fine. And there's a lot of student discounts for things. Mm -hmm. Personally, um, especially for travel. I think there, there were a lot of student rates for flights and things when I went out of the country and the tube, um, you know, the, the TFL Transport for London had a really great thing where you can get a student tube card, meaning that your fares, most of the time, if you're hopping on, I, I would take like, I'd take a bus here, a tube here, a bus here, you know, take the, the, the riverboat and I, I'd be on six different things within an hour and it would cost me 50 minutes. So definitely look for student discounts for transport, student discounts for food, a lot, and because that will help you immensely. Um, <laughs> as I kind of alluded to before, a lot of things in Iceland are expensive because they felt the uh, economic crash in 2008 pretty hard. But there's a lot of like cheat codes to it. So like food at restaurants and bars is going to be expensive. That's a given. You just sort of plan when you're going out to the city to spend a lot of money. Um, taking like buses between the major towns can be expensive, but you can get around it by renting a car is actually pretty cheap. You can rent a car for the weekend that's going to end up being cheaper than like taking buses everywhere. Plus you get like everybody drives there. So uh, being able to drive is such a great luxury. You just need like to have a credit card and a working driver's license. Um, 
I ended up saving a lot of money on food because of the way that our community was structured. I ended up having like a grocery crew for like a food family. Uh, it was six of us and we bought groceries together. It offset the cost so much. It was also the most fun I've ever had with a group of people. <laughs> Just like buying food together, going to the grocery store, messing around and then like cooking each night. Um, and that's, other than just being fiscally responsible, it was a way in which I made friends that I'm going to have for the rest of my life. Um, and that can be applied basically anywhere. Yeah. Essentially, yeah, take Maggie's advice and also just like every, every place has like their discount, like their dollar store or their uh, like place. I don't know what the cheap grocery store here is. Um, the sharp shopper, you just inquire to the people who live there all the time what is the cheapest because they will always tell you like, yeah, I saved 50 bucks to go to this place. I think also as an additional addendum, I don't know how old y'all are, but alcohol gets expensive real quick, <laughs> especially if you were living in a, in a city. And I'm, I'm just saying that to be completely reasonable, especially in London, you know, it, do, I, I'm not saying don't make a habit out of it because it can be fun, but don't, if you go out to bars a lot, if you're going out to pubs, your tabs are gonna rack up really, really quickly. And that can be a good way of just losing a ton of money in a night and not realizing it at all. And also, and, and you know, London has a great public transport system, so you really don't, there's, there's very, there's much less worry about people drinking and driving, but you, you never wanna be that guy on the top of the night bus that's just plastered because they've, you know, gone through all of their money. So I think that's that's definitely something that I think not a lot of study abroad students realize was how, like, you know, because people are excited, you know, I can drink in this country, you know, and it's, I think people lose track of how expensive that can get quite quickly because they're excited about having that that freedom. So it's definitely a thing you have to learn to balance. Since I was a year abroad, um, I'd be a little bit more careful with my money. Um, and I mean, you said Maggie, Paris was just as expensive as London. Um, into the nightclub was like 15 euro and then drinks were 10 bucks a piece so it went up quickly unfortunately <laughs> um but yeah the way i kind of dealt with it is make like a really simple budget um track what you're spending each week um and then i kind of went a little bit deeper gave like a qualification so like groceries like i need that <laughs> club maybe not maybe next week i don't have to pay for that like 30 euro for that club um and then over time you can kind of see where your money is going which is really important um, at dive bars for like stuff you want to do like say for example do you really want to go to I don't know somewhere else in Europe or wherever you are for a weekend or a week long trip maybe you just tail down your, your budget for like two or three weeks and you have enough money to go um, so I guess make priorities with what your money is going to spend over yeah so I kind of had a different experience um, of course I was only there for like two or three weeks so I didn't have as much like time to spend money um, but the conversion rate in Vietnam is awesome for us. <laughs> um, one US dollar is 23,000 plus uh, Vietnamese dong. Um, I remember the first day that I was there, it's very hot, so like you would drink a lot of water. And the first day that I was there, I actually bought a two liter bottle of water that like converted to less than 50 cents of US money. <laughs> so I actually spent a lot less money than I thought I did. So I came back with like 150 like, US dollars. <laughs> Um, and I only brought over like 350, so I only spent like 200 bucks when I was there. Um, which that's only like three weeks, so. Um, but yeah. but it was very nice, the conversion rate in Vietnam, very, very nice. Talk about like the negotiating thing. Oh yeah, so um, if you guys are interested in Vietnam, which you should be, um, <laughs> the negotiation, so anything that you buy on the street, they're kind of offended if you don't bargain. So like they might say like, 200 dong and you're like no <laughs> like try 100 um and so like they would try 100 and then they would like the one guy laughed at me and i walked away and he was like no 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 <laughs> so i came back um but it's like if you don't bargain um you can get like such a bigger deal which like honestly like we were bargaining for like 50 cents like us cents but it gets fun like in the beginning i was like scared and then at the end i'm like no i got this <laughs> Um, so it's like really um, kind of a fun way to do it too, and you save a bit of money there too, so that works. Alright, well, with that in mind then, I'm going to wrap up the panel, but if you 
guys are okay? 